Um, the first panel discussion will be on AI for healthcare opportunities and ethical concerns. And with this, I hand over to, um, to our mo first moderator, Gordon Cheng, another colleague from TUM. Gordon, are you there? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, good. Are we in the afternoon? Good afternoon, uh, Christoph. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to chair this session. Um, um, I just give you a, a brief introduction. I'm a professor at the Technical University of Munich. Um, I work on a, a whole number of area, um, including robotics, um, AI, and neuroengineering. And, um, I, and the endeavor in my work is that I want to actually make an impact onto the uh, well-being of others. Right? Um, so, and much more humble and um, we, we work on a lot, uh, working a lot with doctors recently and hospitals. And that's my whole focus in the next um, uh, 15 year until I retired. So um, without further uh, uh, ado, um, AI enabled technology has an enormous uh, potential for the use in um, healthcare the healthcare sector and ranging from diagnostic application to uh, hotel uh, ho hospital management and uh, vaccine and development. And one of the key, um, I think, during this time, I think um, this is something that is really, really, really uh, uh, critical, especially in this COVID era uh, of the pandemic. And I think I'm going to draw on some of these discussion in uh, with the panel uh, members. And um, I just want to give you a rundown on some of the panel uh, members. Um, today, we will have a um, uh, uh, Executive Director of uh, Kristen uh, Goodman. He's a Global Head of uh, AI and Vice President at um, Tito. And he works on a strategy and execution of um, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning for business, startup, and government organization. He has over 20 million of uh, year, uh, 20 plus years of, um, of industrial and scientific um, and technical experience in AI. And he has worked across many industry and many would, uh, many industry, including um, IBM, HP, and many startup. And the second pa uh, panel member, we have um, uh, Samira uh, Samati D. Uh, she's a group leader at the Max Planck Institute. She is also a faculty member of the International Max Planck Research School and an associate faculty member of the Max Planck um, ATH Center for um, Learning System. And her research background is in machine learning and algorithm design and, uh, with um, recent focus on developing fair and efficient um, machine learning um, uh, models. And the third, um, the third member of our panel, uh, who do not need introduction, is Christoph. Um, he's a full professor of the business, um, uh, business ethic and director of the Institute for uh, Ethics, Artificial Intelligence at the Technical University. He, I, I think I don't need to go through all the awards and all the other things that he has um, um, been through. So I will skip that a little bit. So I want to um, let the panel member have a, a short self-introduction. And then also, then we're going to go leading into some of the question of, you know, what are the potential and what are the uh, 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 benefits of uh, AI and some of the pitfall. And I want to um, quote somebody, uh, Christoph and I was in a meeting um, in 2019, just before the pandemic. We were invited by uh, Emmanuel Macron, right? Um, with a hundred, I think he invited a hundred and 20 top leader in AI from around the world. And um, in his speech, um, which um, uh, rings a bell for me is that um, he said, um, the AI in, um, in Europe, it's an ethical AI, okay? And this also uh, resonate with the previous um, closing remark from Professor Fiverr, All right? So I'm gonna let the um, panel member to do a short self-introduction, and then we we'll lead on to a discussion of um, of uh, various topic. And I am like to be the gentleman. I like to say, please, ladies first. Thanks for the introduction. 
Uh, I'm Samira. I'm a research group leader at Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen. Um, yeah, and um, I was very excited for this event to happen in person, but uh, it changed. But I'm glad that we can still uh, have the panels and the discussions. Um, I, um, yeah, by, my background is in um, uh, machine learning. Um, my group here is called Human Aspects of Machine Learning. So I study, this involves like studying uh, fairness in machine learning, developing machine learning algorithms that um, are fair and ethical, um, that make fair and ethical decisions for, for humans. And um, also currently I work on um, designing machine learning systems that can collaborate with humans in the best way. So uh, in a lot of scenarios for specifically like in, in medicine right now, uh, we have a lot of uh, machine learning technology developed that has very high accuracy in, in prediction tasks um, that for example, involve like um, chest X-ray, but um, because of the sensitivity of these decision makings, these machine learning models, they cannot make the final decision on their own. Uh, so I study what is the best way that human doctors and these machine learning models can collaborate with each other so that uh, we have the best outcomes, both in terms of accuracy and fairness. Um, yeah. About myself and then a bit of maybe an intro about the topic AI and health. But first, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, uh, really nice to be here and uh, a great opportunity and an important event. Gordon, you already made a fantastic introduction. Uh, what more to say here? Other than perhaps that I'm also that AI and health and medicine and pharmaceutical is really one of my top areas. I, I love this area of myself. I'm also at the Karolinska Institute here in Stockholm and uh, AI and health is just one of the, in my opinion, one of in my personal preference when it comes to research and, and industry activities in this area. And um, maybe I can uh, just say a few more things uh, broader. Why AI and health? Um, I think um, this is an area where we have a lot to gain. Uh, it's sort of known for almost at least a decade. Many calculations have been made that the increase of non-transmittable chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, mental conditions, and so on, are very much on the rise. Uh, aging and so on, these are humongous problems. And we also know today that we cannot, uh, we cannot address these problems with the classical way of dealing with it, which is often just you know employing more nurses and doctors and so on. But instead, I think we really have to innovate our way out of it. And uh, it, technologies like artificial intelligence are some of these technologies, which uh, I'm working with both at the Karolinska Institute in terms of using uh, machine learning models in the healthcare system, but also uh, industrially, like uh, I'm with tier to every, uh, we are one of the largest IT companies and we are introducing um, uh, technology solutions and AI solutions into the healthcare system. So it's very important here to work on that. And, um, and uh, yeah, so there are just uh, many, many examples where this technology will make a huge impact. And we are together here to also, I think, be very honest and frank about how, uh, what, you know, what the benefits and what the potential dangers or ethical concerns are. So I leave this as an introduction. There's a um, whole big text behind that, but I'm looking forward to a rigorous, good discussion around the topic. Thank you so much. Christoph, over to you. <laughs> yes. So, um, Maybe a few more remarks about um, what what we are doing here and what what my background is. So <clears throat> I have been um, I, with this with this institute actually I have been finally uh, able to combine uh, both my my former subjects which I had been studying because I, I started with uh, information systems. I got my first degree in information systems, uh, Wirtschaftsinformatik as it was called um in uh well yeah more than 25 years ago and then turned to philosophy and, and who had been i have been working on ethics and, and business ethics especially for many years and and now with this uh with this, this the dawn of ai ethics i was first it was more like digital ethics and now ai ethics i was able to to combine these two interests again and and what i find so very exciting about this about the entire AI ethics uh, discourse is is how fast it has taken off, um, and I have seen in the last 
25 years or even more, um, a lot of other uh, applied ethics discussions trying to get going. Um, and in, in most of these cases, I think in all of them, it, it took much, much longer. Um, and, and with AI ethics, apparently the need was felt much earlier um, that there the need for such a discourse and and this is i find very um very very good um uh, maybe it mirrors to some extent these um these famous numbers that we have how long did it take for for uh, a major airline to get one million passengers how how fast uh, did uh, did uh, microsoft arrive at 100 million or oh, 1 million users uh, and, and and then on to Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go took like, uh, I don't know, a few minutes or maybe hours <laughs> to, to reach that number. So, but, but I think for, for the ethics discussion in general, this is this is quite an amazing uh, development that we see. And yes, so I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm happy to, to share uh, some of my um, experiences and, and ideas about opportunities and, and benefit benefits also when it comes to AI in the field of healthcare. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the panel member. I love this panel member because we have a diversity, right? And this is a very important thing. And I, I resonate with um, Chris, uh, the comment that it should be a conversation and it should be a dialogue and we need this. Okay, so I want to start off with, um, you know, the current hottest topic is COVID. Uh, and every country have done their best to actually manage this. Uh, can AI make a big contribution? Uh, I mean, now, you know, usually people say we don't have enough data. We don't have enough data. I think we have a, a lot of data. Uh, how are we going to actually deal with this? So um, would anyone want to jump in on this to kick this thing starting off? Could maybe I could lay out a, a reflection. I was uh, uh, there, there was a health, World Health Summit. I found that quite insightful. The World Health Summit uh, was just happening a couple of months ago. I think it was also in Munich, actually, in person. Uh, and the WHO mentioned at the time that the very many uh, uh, trials that happened in the last two years to find out how the COVID uh, how the COVID virus behaves. Uh, what type of vaccines or measures and medications could be possible. There were thousands done across the world, but many of them were actually quite uncoordinated, unfortunately. And so the conclusion was that the only ones that truly gave insightful, important answers to, uh, to the COVID situation, what we should do, were the ones that were sort of platform-based, where a lot of data and a lot of resources uh, are enabled to make much more scientific conclusions. So one was a recovery one, and another one was, I think, called Solitaire, or there was another one. And so they, these are the big platforms. And I think this is one example where, for, for, where you have data that can be structurally uh, compiled, where you have the same standards and the same criteria by which you sort of are able to access this information, then also apply uh, the right statistical models or even AI models in order to fully utilize this information. So I found that a very insightful uh, insightful uh, conclusion. And then I might add and combine this a little bit to what Christoph mentioned. When I'm looking back the ethical and, uh, and the ethical AI debate, when I was in the, uh, in the first projects in the 90s, we, uh, we were actually looking at something called micro simulations for pandemics. So we would represent every single citizen uh, of a country uh, uh, and then see how they would behave and how you sort of how, how viruses would spread and how quickly you should uh, develop COVID vaccines. So that's, uh, there's a lot we can uh, do here. And I was also involved in projects where, for example, simplified AI and intelligence services could be provided to elderly people. There was a school, you know, 20, 25, the internet came and everything became very complicated, but we looked very much, and I, uh, this was also driven, I don't know if you were calling it like ethical development per se, but we were driven by the idea of making all these new services accessible to everyone in society. So certainly in a, a, social, a social ambition in order to make these types of technologies accessible to everyone and also include everyone in society to be fully, fully, uh, fully in these measures. And I think it applies today just as it, it did in the past. We need to, for example, reach everyone in society to understand what 
uh, what the situation is in every single country. Uh, communication is often one of the the biggest bottlenecks when it comes to to pandemics, crisis, uh, catastrophe moments. So so that is something where I strongly believe AI can 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 help. And I could give many more examples, but that's a short. Okay. Okay. Um, I well, I, I can say a bit about uh, what what we have been doing here um, since, as I mentioned before, the consortium uh, that we formed was in, in partly in, in in response to to the to pandemic, and um, for me, actually, uh, I have to say, um, the pandemic and and the the problems that that um, arose with this. Uh, with, with regard to AI, uh, have also a bit changed my view on 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 AI ethics and and about what are the most urgent and pressing problems. Um, I, I think um, um, well well first uh, I think there was over over excitement about what AI can do or could do at, at this point. Um, um, I, I mean the. the, the People believe that the, um, the the COVID apps would end the pandemic, more or less. Yeah, something like that. Twenty twenty, um, and um, um, I think we are not yet there. Uh, so um, this this was one thing that was I think this over excitement, and and on the other hand, uh, we are also seeing. Um, uh, problems uh, that are highlighted. I mean, problems with AI systems that are highlighted by the way that some of these apps have been used in in the uh, in the pandemic. So we we are, for example, here done an, a research brief about comparing the different apps and how they work and and what problems they have. And and uh, for me, um, for example, the problems of of surveillance. Uh, I mean, pr privacy anyway, but but also surveillance have become much more urgent and 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 the dangers associated with them more more realistic uh, than than they they may might have seen before um so um i i think we are we are now we have made progress i, I would say um we we are still uh, we are still not yet there with uh, ai helping us out of the pandemic i mean helping maybe i would I would uh, concede that I think we will we'll have to make a lot of development here uh, when it comes to AI in this area and not just in the again not just in the technical sense but in the ethical or, or, or governance sense uh, of, of these systems so that they can really be helpful uh, with crises like this. Okay, um, thank you Christoph. Would you like to jump in a bit? Um, yeah, so um, I, I think one other point that I'd like to mention that is not a, a specific to COVID, but in general is um, how can we use AI to change, to change the relationship of people like with these uh, new diseases or with the treatments, you know? Like uh, one issue that we are facing right now in Germany is that like um, there is, there are a big fraction of people who are, um, for 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 their own reasons, uh, they are against vaccination, and um, um, I don't want to discuss here whether whether this is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. But if if there is a belief or if there is a tr ground truth, whether like uh, for for any kind of disease or any kind of disease that is a spreading, that better it is the right thing to have the treatment right now in terms of like the globally and the society and how it spreads, then how can we use AI to, to better educate people about this disease and to change their relationship with uh, the treatment and, and the information that is around. There has been a lot of missing, so there has been a lot of wrong information being spread around um, especially like, for example, in my home country, in Iran, like um, I see my relatives and my friends like uh, talking a lot of wrong information about COVID. Um, and this is this this naturally happens in any situation when like people panic. And uh, yeah, and there there has been efforts of like using AI to prevent distribution of this misinformation to validate them to educate people. But I think this pandemic also showed us that we need um, more efforts in this direction. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I, I want to follow up on this uh, a little bit. Um, because what you're uh, referring to is more about that managing of data, right? Managing of news, managing of data. And um, it's also that, um, you know, I, being a techie, right, I appreciate how people develop algorithms and all this, right? Uh, to actually deal with a lot of the massive data. But it's also that it will come to a point where we have garbage in, garbage out, right? And what you're uh, referring to is more, how do we actually select what is the most correct knowledge? And this will go into the ethical debate. How do we define correct, right? And um, this, I think everybody, uh, not everybody, there's a contrary view at the moment to do full lockdown or no lockdown at all, right? I come from uh, three, uh, living in three different countries, right? Australia, lockdown completely. Japan, almost lockdown, but I managed to get in. Germany, hey, right? So I think this, um, Controlling of misinformation or sorting of these misinformation is going to be a huge debate. I, I just want to get your thought on this a bit more. Uh, you can, I, you know, I'm a techie, so if you want to go down to the algorithmic level, I love it. I, I, maybe I, I, I also can just add now that we reflect a bit on nationalities. I have several, I have several, several nationalities too. Now I happen to live in Sweden. Uh, we don't have many of these discussions. We have a very, very, very different approach, I would say. Uh, there are no lockdowns, there are no masks here, uh, and so far, so good, good enough, I would say. Um, I was then also thinking communication, as I mentioned earlier, is probably one of the most important things, as Samira pointed out. I, I think this is in, particularly in any catastrophe or crisis uh, uh, situation, a very important commodity that both it is uh, distributed well, and that the information is authentic. I was leading the uh, pandemic and healthcare uh, initiatives at the British Telecom in the Middle East. So I'm actually uh, also aware of this part of the world and what it means um, to this part of the world. And I would, uh, I would say that, for example, related technologies that could go hand in hand to, for example, double check its, uh, the, the origins, uh, authenticity of that data. There you, we, we could also apply uh, technologies like blockchain, right? or maybe even NFTs so in order to know where the information originated from. That could be one starting point. Um, and I would also like to challenge Chris, or like not challenge, I don't know if Christoph and I, we are on the same view here, but I, I would almost argue, I was thinking to myself, you know, and I have tried really hard last year to introduce AI technology to the Nordic and European ecosystem in order to make this all a bit better. And I totally, I'm aware that we have a lot of, uh, let's say, restrictions and how we can utilize digital technologies and AI technologies, right? But I could, I could say, and I have spoken to many organizations and the governments here, that we do not have the same representation at the government level or healthcare level as, for example, other organizations like the pharmaceutical organizations. And I'm not saying that is bad or good, per se, but it means that we have much less uh, opportunities to demonstrate what the what this technology can do on the opportunity side. And of course, be very honest about the, the downsides, you know, on the potential risks of this technology. So in, for me, one of, the, uh, one of the conclusions is that over the last two years, this technology has not been fully understood. And then I think there were many, many apps approaches. Christoph will be very interesting to see how your research turns out as to which apps were most effective. My, I wouldn't be surprised if many of them probably didn't show maximum effect, partly because we have a, a huge bureaucracy and jungle of, of administration, which just makes it extremely difficult, in my opinion, to bring this out. And, and this is also my concern, and we may have time for this later, but you know, with the regulations uh, and ethical frameworks we want to introduce, it's important to have them, but I think they cannot hamper innovation and they cannot hamper us in Europe to not, uh, not develop uh, the best state-of-the-art AI in combination with human-centric uh, views ahead of us. So I think that's very important. Okay, the point that I wanted to add is not um, it's not directly related to the question that um, Christian was asking from Christo um, or the challenge, uh, but I wanted to bring up a more uh, a more constructive way of how AI can help uh, resolving this issue of spreading misinformation. 
Um, and I want to look at it from a different perspective a bit of like, not, not exactly how we can prevent spreading misinformation, but how can we help spreading correct information? And this is something that AI has shown to be able to help with. Uh, for example, there has been research on, um, we have a lot of research on modeling social networks of people and then choosing nodes in these social networks uh, and then uh, so that these nodes can influence the social network in the maximum way, right? So then, for example, in times of COVID, this, uh, if, if we can use these apps uh, or the, the social networks that we have to um, to build a network of the people. And then if we can choose in, uh, like influential people in these network and somehow educate them correctly about and give them correct information about COVID, uh, then these people naturally will uh, spread this information in the network, you know? So um, this would be a much more efficient way of um, spreading correct uh, information. And for example, this has been done um, in, in other areas, for example, for uh, shelters uh, where they want to educate um, a few people in the shelter so that, for example, about HIV or other diseases, so that these people then go and educate people around them, but choosing these people in a way to maximize the influence over the network. Mm -hmm. so I think something similar. So you're possible. suggesting using bias in a positive way. Yes, using influence in a positive way. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Christoph, you want to jump in? Yes. So let me just share maybe the, the link to our research briefs again, uh, that we did several research briefs about the use of AI uh, uh, tools uh, to manage the pandemic in during the last year. And um, um, while, it, of course, there, there are a lot of, of uh, technical, uh, technical points here, um, what, what we can say is that um, the uptake that we've seen, the more, the greater use of the apps, that uh, was closely connected to uh, to the to governance questions. Uh, how how was the introduction done? How what, what were the rules for and 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 um, the frameworks for for these apps in which they were used? And also, what was the trust in government and and past mm -hmm. experiences with with uh, other pandemics? Also, exposure to surveillance technology to some extent. So, so what you see, if, if you if you look at these research briefs, it is we we found there is again this close close connection between between um, the efficient or the efficiency of these apps and and the um, the governance and the, the way that you do the governance of these apps. And I think this is um, also for the future an important aspect that we will have to take into account when designing new new tools and, and new systems. Uh, we will have to um, we will have to uh, right at the start uh, face these questions and see how how do we deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I, I'm just reading your I, I like this one. Is it um, culture is tied with technology adaptation and cultural and government factor? I think that's what you're leading to, right? That was one of the things I wanted to bring up. Actually, culturally, I can see so many culture. Uh, as you know, just within Europe, it, it's so different, it's so diverse in the way we uh, tackle this problem. So, do you want to highlight any of these um, uh, in your brief, in your research brief? That particular one. Um, yes, I mean the the examples that we 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 gave uh, were there was one, uh, for example, about the, the 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 Singapore app, which was was uh, had a number of concerns. Uh, uh, also, um, um, others were more widely used. Um, um, I mean, we have to revisit this, at, 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 I think, at this point, because, I mean, we have, as I said, these were done last year in, during uh, summer and spring last year. And uh, I mean, at that point, we thought, well, it's, 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 we have our Corona app in Germany and it, it, um, 
it is doing very well with it in, in terms of um, of um, um, ethical or governance um, uh, aspects. But on the other hand, what did it achieve? I mean, we have to ask ourselves, what did it actually achieve? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have done it, but I think there was a lot of um, yeah over excitement, as I said before. What do you think, Christian? You're nodding. <laughs> oh, no, exactly right. I I I am thinking also. It, it's an extremely important question, right? Um, uh, and I think it was Jens Spahn, the health minister of Germany, even suggesting that uh, there were many many restrictions made to the app so to not even get close to any breach of existing uh, personal or integrity policies, which is perfectly understandable, but I wonder if we have truly had the chance to demonstrate what such a simple app could do, which is not arguably not even in the AI space, it's just a digital technology at this point, right? If he had, um, if he were finding better ways, like for example, federated learning, privacy preserving technologies, it's a whole bunch of things we could have, in my opinion, could have applied in order to have a much uh, better and bigger impact and I, I obviously was like politely challenging you in a sense that I, I was sort of thinking if he had uh, a very good solution from a digital or AI perspective could it could be an app could be other technologies that comply with our human human centric way and the human rights I do believe that not only could the impact have been better but I, I would have I could see that we could truly uh, how to say, deal with these types of pandemics much better, arguably perhaps even to an extent where we would not nowhere near be in the situation that we are in here now, starting, starting with very fast development of drugs. Uh, you know, Halicine was one of the first AI developed drugs beginning last year. Uh, I talked at the Royal Society of Medicine about that, you know, quick, quick uh, discovery of new drugs, which is a very data intensive sort of uh, development. The next one is how do you distribute these types of drugs? Another big area is communication, as Samira pointed out many times, I think this alone, focusing on how you tailor the information to specific parts of the population, translating the information, making the information authentic, and so on and so on. There's a whole many things, in my opinion, that um, we haven't even tapped yet. And I think that 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 could have made things and can still make things much much better from that perspective so yeah but I, I agree with you also that the current technologies that the governments in europe have introduced such as the app i think they were underwhelming that's okay i, I think uh, when the follow-up research will actually teach us a lot more about the next pandemic if, if you don't mind i want to shift a little bit a little away from the pandemic i think we you know, we had two years of it and we just had about 20 minutes of it already. So let's shift a little bit towards our, I think uh, there's an interesting question about machine learning in diagnostic, right? There's going to be issue of trust. There's going to be issue of, uh, you know, do I give responsibility to a machine or do I give respon uh, still have my doctor telling me, you know, this is correct or this is not correct. So I, I want to just throw that in there and um, open up to discussion on that one. <laughs> sure, I'm sure all of us have much to say. And I think even Samira mentioned earlier that part of your research is this human, human AI collaboration, right? That's immediately coming to my mind where I see in many instances, the application of medical AI systems being something that complements and augment the outcome of one or several healthcare professionals. Uh, rather than saying, hey, you have a completely self, we start off with a completely self-standing AI system that does diagnostics and radiology, uh, and we just send something there and then we get a result back that may well be something we can consider in the future. But at this point, I see, uh, for example, in radiology uh, and, a, and an approach where you have, you know, a human AI system that work together, which to some extent we already have today, uh, have a second opinion. Today we have actually two fully, uh, at least I think in Sweden and most places in the world, there's two radiologists that confirm a diagnosis when they have MRIs or X-rays when it is severe, uh, severe diagnosis. Um, to have a double check, let's say, but second check could potentially be done uh, by by an AI. So uh, so I see this being a a useful application. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, as um, so to complement what Christian had said, um, um, yeah, so I would say that this is an area that is actually very understudied right now. So um, like the way we thought about machine learning like 10 years ago um, was that like we consider machine learning systems in isolation, right? These were systems that they had a task and we wanted to, them to get really good at that task. So whether it was image classification or um, any other kind of task, like we, we cared about like increasing the accuracy of these system on that a specific task. But I'd say over the time, the way machine learning um, uh, has become good at many tasks that influence our day-to-day -day lives and influence humans, now that is not enough to consider these systems in isolation. And uh, especially in medicine, uh, as it has been mentioned, like machine learning is very good at some tasks, even better than humans. But it's still like um, they cannot be the final decision makers, um, as as you have said, because of the issues of responsibility um, and um, issues of trust, um, issues of humans not still being used to like um, getting predictions from from machine learning, issues of explainability that at the end, like the patient wants to know why they were diag diagnosed with this specific disease. Um, so because of all these issues and um, maybe I can um, talk a bit about like the maybe I can unpack uh, this whole situation of collaborations between machine learning and humans a bit uh, and uh, what we can study in machine learning to understand these situations better. So, um, so from the algorithmic side, um, um, one can look at it as a purely algorithmic problem that uh, you have you have some data set, you have this set of patients, um, each of them like um, you have different attributes for each patient, and um, it could be that your machine learning algorithm is good at predicting. Um, some of these patients, right? It could be that your data, so I'm, so I, I recently moved from US, so most of my, um, most of my um, categorization of societal groups is still in terms of race. Um, so I refer, I, I still refer to these racial categories. I, although I know that in, in Europe, like these categorization should be done differently. Uh, but just just for the sake of discussion, like uh, let's say that your your data set uh, is um, has majority white population in it, right? So it could be that like your machine learning algorithm has very high prediction on this population, but um, you might be able to access doctors and physicians who have been dealing with um, black patients for their whole life. So. So now it, it's a purely algorithmic problem that how can you distribute this data between these two experts that you have such that you can optimize the accuracy at the end, right? Um, so similar way to how we think about accuracy, we can also think about fairness, right? That this data was uh, heavily um, dominated by white patients. So the ag is so, the accuracy of the machine learning algorithm on black patients is low and this has implications on fairness that like if I make predictions for these minority group patients then uh, my predictions have very low accuracy which means that this is not fair to that population. So how can a team now humans and machine learning to optimize for fairness now. And then this becomes very interesting because then you can design these systems in a way such that these two agents complement each other. Right. It could be the case that you can present some information about the machine learning to the human to attract humans attention that, hey, look, machine learning uh, is actually having very low accuracy on this minority group. And this this then becomes very interdisciplinary because like we in economists, experimental economists have studied this a lot in terms of like advice taking, right? So now you can think of this as machine learning giving advice to the human and then uh, human um, taking this advice into account. Uh, so then it, this brings up the question of what information do you want to show to the human? Uh, how do they interpret this information, right? Because like, um, for example, in human computer interaction research, they have shown that like we interpret 
these notions very differently. If you show me something about confidence, I interpret it completely different from another person. So uh, this should also uh, be very well studied that like how do humans interpret these notions and how different interfaces can, um, can convey uh, different informations to humans. And uh, yeah, finally, you brought up the issue of trust and responsibility. And um, that is something that uh, like we need as machine learning scientists to help from people from policy and legal side right from the beginning of when we design these algorithms. And uh, the, 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 the extent of the collaboration should be very clear. Um, if human is at the end of this pipeline and like human gets advice, and some side information from machine learning, but at the end, this is the human who have to decide, then the burden of responsibility can also affect how they collaborate with AI, right? So we have research that shows that like very young doctors, like uh, they, they have a lot of tendency to, to, to rely on the decision of the AI because uh, they wanna avoid responsibility. They don't have a lot of experience, right? And on the other hand, like very experienced doctors uh, to ignore uh, recommendations of AI because they rely on their own experience much more. Um, yeah, so so it's very important to study these both from the algorithmic and technical side uh, of how we can increase the diversity of machine learning data sets, how we can design uh, algorithms that are more fair, all the way to the other side of the pipeline of like what are the interactions between human and machine learning? How does these interactions affect the final accuracy and fairness of the decisions? And also how these issues of responsibility and trust affect how humans collaborate with machine learning. Thank you. I, I, I come back to your point on data later. I, I give uh, Christopher a, a shot at this first. Yes, uh, actually, because I would like to pick up on the issue of trust. Um, and I have a few slides only, and, or just maybe one or two, which I would like to show at this point if it works. Um, can you see them? Um, because uh, when it comes to trust, I think it's interesting to see at what does the public think about it. Uh, and uh, as we know, often the, the image of, of Germans being very critical of, of, well, new technology in general and AI maybe in particular uh, is, is perpetuated over, over and over. Um, th this is a study that was done by Bitcom last year. And of course it could be taken with a grain of salt, but it was a substantial survey and it showed that in the field of healthcare at least, Germans would like to see an AI deployed uh, um, more uh, in in by by uh, well, uh, seventy five percent of, of the people uh, was said that so which is more than in other areas uh, even in the, oh yeah in, for example in autonomous cars and I mean there even there it was more than fifty percent. Um, and in the education, which was very surprising to me, it was more than 50%. But if, if already at this point, 75% would say we should have more of it in healthcare and 67% in medicine, which that shows that, that apparently the trust is not zero to, to these, uh, to these um, um, systems. Um, yeah, I, I, th I didn't want to show much here, but, but maybe this point, uh, because I think we have some more questions from the floor. Yeah. Um, I, I'll just um, highlight a couple of questions. There's one question that I, I particular that um, resonate with me that what um, Samira was saying, it's about data and decision making uh, and uh, applying transparency. And um, so let me give you a background. I was uh, having a dinner with the director of um, DeepMind, you know, the Google DeepMind. And what he said to me, he said, how are you going to compete with us? We want data, we can get data, right? Uh, so, and it was a fair comment. It was a very fair comment, right? Because, but what I, my critic to them was that, you know, it's, you know, data is data, garbage in, garbage out, right? It's still, you're going to face that particular issue. And there's a particular question by um, Manuel would, uh, would not make sense to make a trained um, decision maker on limitation and uh, apply transparency. 
right? It, it is about what are we gonna, how do we actually make usefulness of the data and make sense of them uh, to make proper decision or keep, I think what you, the, uh, the suggestion is keep proper recommendation rather than making the decision is what I understood from the discussion so far. So the first question is like, why don't we just gather more data, right? So as you mentioned, like um, gathering the data, um, first of all, like when you want to gather the data, you should make sure that like, uh, this is the correct data that you need, right? So in, uh, in medicine specifically, like we have a lot of evidence that, um, for example, if you look at the data from some privileged neighborhoods, like the healthcare data that you have from these privileged data, these are very like um, comprehensive data. And like um, since since they were able to pay their bills like uh, on time, the, the timing on the data reflects actually the time of the visit and you can draw very better conclusions about these areas, right? And contrarily, like for, for, for much poorer neighborhoods, like the electronic data was not stored the, the way that it is stored on the privileged um, areas. And therefore, like there is, a, there is a very big variance in the quality of the data and the information that they represent. So, so this is the first, the first issue on collecting more data from minority groups. Um, the second issue is that the relationship that these minority groups have with technology, and this is the big barrier on how we can collect data from them, right? There has been a recent, uh, the, I'm sure you've heard about it in the news, that um, uh, there are a lot of efforts, for example, to make diverse facial image data sets, and Google um, was trying to push this forward to have like more diversity in the facial image data sets. And what they did was that they hired people in Atlanta area to go and um, like upload selfies um, to, to increase the ratio of like black people in their data set, right? And uh, the way this ended up to be was that, that people went to homeless black people in Atlanta and gave them a $5 gift card and then like to, took a took a photo with them and uploaded this so so just through this process you can see that like the the initial goal was that you wanted to collect more data from black people and the process of how it happened and like that you are ending up like adding a very 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 specific minority group to your to your data collection so so yeah so so in a in a nutshell like collecting more uh, good data is always great, but it's not always possible. Um, and, and because of these issues of relationships of minorities with technology, like it's very hard to ask them to provide data. Uh, and uh, this is a challenge that we should work toward, um, like not only on the technology side, but building better relationship with these minorities and like uh, telling them about the technology that we are building, what is the goal of the technology so that we build better trust in them so that they provide data to us and may and giving them this confidence that we are we are caring about this data with care and privacy and it will not be used against them because they have a very bad experience um, in this in this aspect in the past. And um, uh my interpretation is that um, if you have a bias in the um, in the system, mm -hmm. that you will actually produce some kind of answer that it cannot be explained. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, it's a lot a lot of the time that you know in AI we talk about explainability. Uh, can you explain to me what I just did instead of a black box? Uh, at the moment, it's very popular. Have a black box, input output. And then it has some correlation, but it cannot explain to me what happened. Uh, and I think when we talk about ethical trust and all this, I think this transparency is going to be a very a, a key role in actually presenting a trustworthy system. Right, right. So, so uh, I think machine learning, when they started talking about explainability, the goal was to build more trust. But over time, like, um, the goal has shifted because um, because explainability didn't end up um, uh, didn't end up exactly like bringing the 
the expectations that we wanted from Expo and Poetry. So, um, so I'm not sure right now. I'm I'm not an expert on explainability. I have I just read things here and there. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think right now explainability um, is helping hugely with the issues of trust. Um, but okay, okay, yeah, okay. Um, any comment on this about trust and explainability? Yeah, <clears throat> certainly. I I I think. Um... The uh, it, there's a couple of thoughts that came to my mind now uh, when it comes to explainability and trust. Uh, one consideration is today when we have doctors utilizing this technology uh, and having this uh, information that an AI provides and making it explainable. So of course, a couple of questions: How explainable should it be? Uh, how should the uh, doctors, to what extent do the doctors need to use this or the ones that are responsible for the diagnosis, what's an appropriate level? But I also wonder, since we published several papers on this provenance versus accuracy aspect, right? So the more provenance, the more explainability you have in the data that makes it, let's say, for healthcare providers more uh, understandable you lose accuracy. That's usually the general rule. And uh, the question is, um, then would you want to leave some of this decision-making to the patients? Uh, would you want to leave some of that decision-making to the patients in terms of asking them, what would you, what would you rather like to have? Uh, do you like to have more accurate results or would you like to have results that can also be explained? So this is a thought that has come up over and over, and it's uh, I don't find it a very easy question, right? Uh, and because usually this is something that doctors ultimately are responsible for. And uh, maybe a second aspect, uh, I, I'm, I'm believing that, and this has happened already vastly in, in almost all spaces, when you have solutions that offer you quick answers about your healthcare data, let's say you have a diagnosis, you have MRIs or blood results or something, and you could essentially share that information, your own personal private medical information with an app, uh, with an AI app somewhere around the world. And it provides you with a quick answer on a diagnosis or treatment options, right? And it, let's say it would be sufficiently, it reaches your level of satisfaction as to what result it provides to you. I think most, um, people would send this data to this type of app in order to receive answers. Uh, now, now I'm thinking this in relationship to the European uh, regulation where we might make this really difficult yes. uh, for the system, but I can see that most people in Europe would send their data elsewhere if they get a quicker answer. If they get an answer in five seconds about some very important topic versus yeah. waiting six weeks before they get an answer. So I think that's something worth considering if you, if you are making it too hard you know, for individuals to receive answers when it comes to important medical questions for their uh -huh. I, I see you bring up Europe. Um, I, I, I think in other countries, they may be more skeptical. In some countries, I think they will be more. Yeah, yeah but do you think, because I'm, I'm wondering today, you know, almost so many people are using services like TikTok, Instagram, yeah. Uh, Google, a lot of information is shared vastly. And in this particular case, when it comes to medical results, I think almost, are there, are there, are there significant exceptions in the world where people are not sharing that data quite, quite willingly, let's say? So I think there, but it could, you correct, you know, depends probably where you send it to and what value you, uh, you seem to get out of it, perhaps. Yeah, I think that's where the trust comes into this play. Yeah. Christoph, you want to? Well, I, I could add something, but there was a question for Samira here specifically in the, in the chat. If you, maybe she wants to put, pick, put a, pick that up first for the rest of the, because we only have a few minutes left. Okay, um, I don't see it. I don't see it. <laughs> uh, the question was, uh, could synthetic data be a short term solution for lack uh -huh. of data on marginalized groups and what yeah. will be the limitations? That's an interesting question. Um, uh, there has been a lot of efforts on synthetic data, but um, like one thing that we should really take into account, and my expertise on, on this data mainly comes from uh, facial image data sets, uh, is that like, for example, there has been a lot of effort on generating synthetic data for facial images. Uh, the issue is that um, like the way 
usually. So there, there has been some very, very recent efforts, um, which we don't know yet how well they are performing, but usually the way that you learn, you train a neural network to generate the synthetic data is that originally they, they learn from some real data, right? And then they, they imitate the patterns to generate some synthetic data. And uh, again, as Gordon mentioned, like garbage in, garbage out, like if you have, if you don't have enough data on minority groups, then the synthetic data that you generate for them uh, could also, will most probably end up not being very representative, right? Um, so for example, for these facial images, when you look at the, the images that are generated for, for minority groups like black people, um, you see that um, a lot of feature, a lot of facial features are taken from white population and then the color of the skin has been changed like by the neural networks. Okay, so then, then you end up with these facial images that um, if, if you show them to a black person, uh, then they will say that this is not really representative of like how a black person would look like. Okay, um, because uh, what uh... What the one of the key challenges is now how uh, we are we are moving from a, in general in AI ethics from a stage where we have seen the development of very high level abstract guide ethical guidelines towards more concrete guidelines and applying these guidelines to concrete systems. And I think with regard to the healthcare sector, this can be made uh, visible maybe in, in such a way as we've done, uh, we've tried to do here. So we have the key, uh, the trustworthy AI requirements here from the European Union. And, and uh, what, what could that uh, mean? Uh, for example, human agents in oversight, that would mean physicians should be in control of making decisions assisted by AI systems. Uh, um, so rather than thinking of this in, in terms of replacing human, human doctors. Um, of course, technical robustness and safety, uh, um, this has to be transformed into repeated auditing of the system and full transparency. You mentioned transparency of data and processes. Um, I mean, I don't want to go into all of these, but maybe some others like accountability is a key factor, of course, and that needs to be uh, transformed or um, yeah, uh, to a clear definition of legal responsibilities and the adaptations in, in case of, of changes. Um, again, um, um, explainability was, was mentioned. I mean, physicians should have full knowledge of the tool and, and uh, be able to explain the process to their patients. I think there the role of, of, the, of the physicians is, is, is still very important. Uh, we, we, we won't, uh, I, I think, exhibit the patient directly to, to, to the AI system, at least not at this point. Uh, um, um, and, and rather, there, there we will have to um, develop all sorts of explainability interfaces, which is a kind of a very interesting uh, task at the moment, both, again, both a technical one as well as a non-technical one. And, uh, and the training data sets, which was mentioned uh, uh, right now also, I mean, I mean this is transforming the, the general requirement of diversity, non-discrimination, fairness towards yeah, personalized uh, medicine diagnosis, but using these uh, diverse and unbiased training sets. And of course, I agree with you that there are a lot of problems. This is not, there's not an easy solution to this way. But I think th this is the way to go to make this more practical. And, and I think we have done this in a very uh, short period of time already coming from the high level abstract ethics towards more concrete guidelines. And I think we will make a lot of progress there in the future too. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I, it's, a, it's a shame I have to come to a closing. If I have to have a wish next time, I would like to have a legal person on the panel because I think you touched on this already uh, because it's going to go towards this liability issue. Right? So that would be a wonderful thing. Um, I wish to thank the panel members. You've been wonderful. It's been a good fun. And um, lastly, I'd like to congratulate Christoph and the team. It's not easy uh, trying to uh, postpone conference up, uh, over and over again. And um, going into virtual mode is, is also a tough challenge. Um, I wish the whole team uh, uh, great success this week. It will be challenging, but um, yeah, I think uh, we'll, you will manage. Uh, and thank you to panel member again, and I thank all the audience.
And I think I can bring this to a close now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And usually I invite people to the lab when the conference is in Munich. So I leave that open for a while, <laughs> for next time. All right, take care. Great. Okay.